Hello everyone, I'm Jessica Shankleman and I'm a journalist with Bloomberg News. I'm excited to be joined today by a great panel of experts to talk about finance in a post-COP26 world. Uh, many of us are still recovering from the intense two weeks in Glasgow at the beginning of November. Um, so please join me in welcoming them to the virtual stage. There's Catherine Zirconic Lopez, who's the global head of ESG at Invesco. Neely Gilbert, Vice Chairwoman at Carbon Direct, and Jana Watson Kukar, Global Managing Partner Emeritus at Dahlberg Advisors. And as always, with all these panels, uh, we'd love to have your questions as well as the questions that I'm asking. So please do, if you have questions for our panelists, type them in the white tab to the right of the video window and then hit submit. And then we're gonna be saving a few minutes towards the end of the session to get to those as well. So Neely, I wanna start by asking you about GFAMS, uh, perhaps not the, the sexiest acronym out there, but it was a major, part of a major announcement at COP26, a group of all sorts of financial firms led by Mark Carney, the former Bank of England governor, said that uh, th that number of companies representing 100 trillion um, now are committed to reaching net zero. So that doesn't mean actually are net zero, but they're on the, the path to getting there. So that was the big announcement we had at COP. What are you expecting as a member of GFANS to happen over the next year ahead of the Sharm El Sheikh conference, COP27 conference, next year? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And you're right, I guess that our uh, responsible investment community is not that great with acronyms, <laughs> but we are getting good at serious initiatives uh, contributing towards all of our shared goals. So uh, by way of background, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, um, as you said, now represents about 450 financial institutions worldwide and around $130 trillion in capital. I come to GFANS in my role as the chair of the investment committee for the David Rockefeller Fund which is a member of the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance. And then GFANS is essentially an alliance of alliances from asset owners to asset managers, banks, insurance companies, and service providers. Um, so all of these companies have committed to transition the assets that they control to net zero by 2050, but importantly, also committed to making interim targets over the next five to 10 years to decarbonize their fair share of global emissions in that time. So in terms of what you can expect from our group in 2022, um, first of all, some members are just now joining, joined in advance of COP26. And so they'll have 12 to 18 months to move from those pledges to announce their official interim targets, as I was describing. And then those who have already uh, joined and made their targets will be moving forward with action towards those targets, um, demonstrating visible leadership on the ground in terms of what we mean when we talk about net zero. Um, so I'm very excited when you think about COP26. I've heard some people say that this was the commitment COP. And I think when we move forward towards COP27, that what the industry and the, the world should expect to see is moving from commitments to action and accountability. And uh, Carbon Direct, you one of the things that you do is invest in carbon removal technologies. That's things like direct air capture, carbon capture and storage. And we saw at COP26, there was a big focus on offsets. Um, countries finally managed to agree the framework for rules around carbon markets. And there's been lots of questions around the kinds of offsets that people are buying. And more and more, we hear about the importance of investing in carbon removal, not just offsets that avoid emissions, things like uh, wind turbines, but, but removals. Do you see what happened at COP26 around Article 6 
really sort of driving investment in carbon removal technologies. Do you think 2022 is going to be the year that we see a step change in investment in carbon re removals? Yes, we should all hope so. Um, you know, of course, institutions around the world will do everything that they can to reduce emissions. And the, the truth is that we also will need to remove significant amounts of carbon that are already in the atmosphere and deal with the, um, the, the emissions that will be hard to abate. Um, and so the progress that we made at COP26 on getting clarity around standards for Article 6 is a start, uh, but we continue to need more clear and um, high quality standards for what we mean when we talk about uh, when we talk about removals. And so when um, I joined Carbon Direct recently as vice chairwoman, it was really because of the focus that the company places on science based standards for what we mean when we talk about uh, quality when it comes to the removal space. What we should expect to see is greater convergence between the standards that are being put forward by the private sector in terms of voluntary carbon markets and the progress that's being made uh, with Article 6 and with individual um, national and local governments in terms of their own standards. And just a reminder again to the audience, please do put your questions in the white tab to the right of the window and hit submit. We really love, want to hear what you're thinking about what our panelists are saying. Catherine, I want to turn to you. Now, at the end of COP26, of course, we had that big announcement. Um, the Glasgow Climate Pact was signed by 197 countries. But along those two weeks, we had what seemed like endless announcements along different lines about uh, uh, agriculture, on deforestation, on transport, on reducing coal. And some of those uh, announcements included companies and they also included some countries, but none of them included all 197 countries that were present at COP. Do you think that those side deals um, that came with all that fanfare, do you think that they are as effective as the final agreement that was made at COP26? when they're just voluntary? Well, so from my perspective, I think in, in some ways they are even more powerful because this is the wider society, this is the wider ecosystem that is really mobilizing around climate change. And I would say specifically net zero um, and just picking up on Neely's point there, specifically on GFAMS, we are at Invesco, part of the net zero asset manager initiative and are in the process in that 12 to 18 month process where we're going through, you know, setting our ambitions and targets, et cetera. So I think, you know, just our organization, but also the wider financial services organizations, as you mentioned, you know, over a hundred trillion dollars of assets, uh, 450 institutions, you know, that is meaningful. And I think COP26 was a significant accelerator and driver of, of some of those commitments coming out. So even just that in itself is, is incredibly powerful. I would say some of the other things that we're, you know, taking notice of and that I personally think is is very important, the deforestation pledge and the electric uh, vehicle pledges, those two I think are, are, are really, really important, particularly deforestation around, you know, natural uh, nature-based solutions, um, looking at uh, conservation finance, all of those topics I think are areas that uh, have a lot more room to grow. And I think as, you know, the finance world really contributing to that deforestation pledge will, will be incredibly important. And on the electric vehicle side, I think, you know, again, that that's the auto sector, obviously, is a big sector of investments. And having those pledges, you know, that is meaningful change for that industry overall. And it's also going to drive supply chain changes. You know, the whole ecosystem is becoming um, more, you know, lower carbon over time, which I think is, is really, really powerful. So do you expect, for example, that deforestation pledge to have a material impact on the financial flows that we're seeing 
um, around the world and whether they're going into um, tearing down rainforests or planting new trees, for example. Yeah, and I think actually, in some to some extent, as Neely mentioned, it, you can already see that the corporates making big pledges around net zero. You're you're having that, uh, you know, the whole offsets uh, market, effectively carbon market around that is is becoming a corporate reality, right? Because it has to be as you can get so far with your own actions, but at some point you are going to have to you know, invest back in, 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 and I would say in, in kind of natural sinks, right. And that is forestation and, and conservation. And so I see them as very closely linked. Hmm. And I mean, Jana, I don't know when, when COP was happening, personally, I found it quite difficult to always understand the business angle of these decisions that governments are making. You know, they're arguing over the minutiae of different legal texts. So how do you join the dots from those agreements that governments are making to then deciding, well, what does this mean for an investor? Thanks, Jess. And I'm glad you actually used that expression, joining the dots, because I think that's exactly the imperative now. The time has come now not to debate any longer whether COP26 was everything we needed it to be, but rather how do we now connect the dots between the commitments made and the capital? You know, what I think is salient is that COPs produce policies and those policy commitments move markets. Now it's incumbent on us to say when the market opens, is the capital getting to the companies that can then scale and grow in those markets. You know, when I look at even a relatively small uh, country like uh, Costa Rica, you know, Costa Rica, I loved how the president described himself, you know, in Costa Rica as a hummingbird in Central America, recognizing that they are not the largest country, but nonetheless, they're very much on the pathway for the Paris Agreement. Now, the electrification commitment that the president has made, that Costa Rica has made, and the policy commitments that Costa Rica has made as part of this broader COP fabric has created an enormous market for electric vehicles in Costa Rica. Interestingly, though, as of just a couple of years ago, there were twice as many new cars, not electric, being registered in, in Costa Rica as there were babies being born. So you have, you know, policies coming out that are creating market opportunities. And yet, I look at a country like Costa Rica, and I see a wide open market just waiting for the capital, for the electric vehicle infrastructure to be able to scale and grow. That's what I hope that we see next. That's the action we need. And um, when we were at COP, you know, the issue that came up over and over again, and of course, not for the first time at this COP, was about how developing countries can access finance. Um, I remember hearing Kenya's environment minister speaking very passionately to Franz Timmermans of the EU saying, you know, it's all very well you saying that there's this billions of dollars a year coming forward, but we aren't able to access it. And it takes years for us to be able to even get, get it when we do apply. So how can the private sector help developing countries to access the finance that they need to um, either adapt to climate change or to invest in the green technologies to decarbonize their grids? Yes, I'll say that this is where I see a gap between rhetoric and reality, and we need to be in the business of closing that gap. You know, the financial community can do a lot to help developing countries access the finance they need. You know, if I look at South Africa, for example, I was delighted to see, you know, the, the Just Energy Transition Partnership announced, but $8 billion for South Africa to decarbonize its economy, while it sounds like a lot, is a drop in the proverbial bucket. You know, the estimates are it's 25 to 30 uh, billion would be needed for that transition. So... From the perspective of the financial sector, on the one hand, South Africa has a very coal-driven economy. On the other hand, there is this commitment now to move towards electrification. How the financial sector can get involved is to sort of say, you know, look at, look at the country and say, A, where are we, where do we have legacy investments in coal and other non-green investments of that ilk? And 
you know, are we going to commit to not making any any further commit, you know, investments of that kind? Now, pragmatically speaking, that's not always feasible. But if the financial sector can be frank about, look, we still have quite a bit of oil and gas and similar kinds of investments and financing going that direction. So we're going to be all the more forward leaning in whether it is developing green bonds for a country like South Africa. There's a whole range of financial instruments that the sector you know, could explore, but making sure that we bridge, don't just say as a financial sector that we're going to lean into green investing and green financing, but to be frank about what we're already doing that is not so green, what we're gonna do going forward that is far greener and get creative about it, so that the countries like South Africa can make a transition, can get the capital they need, but make the transition in a way that is mindful of the broader sort of economic context, not losing jobs, for example. And Neely, I want to ask a similar question to you, because at COP26, we actually got to a point where India was saying, we will only step up our carbon commitments if we get a trillion dollars by 2030 from rich countries, and all of that has to be public money. We don't want any private money. Um, how, did, how did we get to a situation where there was so much anger from a country like India, and how can the private sector show that it can be a force for good in helping a country like India to decarbonize without harming its economy? Um. Well, I think that a, a lot of trust has been lost, right, over the, the course of time uh, from these commitments that have been made and not met. And um, a lot of that trust has been lost, frankly, from the commitments that were made by the public sector, um, from governments. And, and so in order to move forward, some of that needs to be redressed. But to the point that was just made, when you look at the scale of capital that's needed, right, it's estimated by 2050 that we'll need $150 trillion to achieve decarbonization worldwide, with two-thirds of that capital going to emerging market and developing countries. Uh, it's clear that it will require both government finance, public finance, and private market capital to achieve commitments um, and, and funding at this scale. And so what I think that we really need to do is to leverage structures like blended capital that bring together that public funding with uh, private capital and in some cases also philanthropic capital in combined structures, innovative structures, uh, to, to, to be able to meet these needs. And when I say innovation, it's not that we don't know how to do this. Um, blended finance has been around for a long time. In some ways, I think it's um, innovation and uh, improvements in the structure of the system, what we kind of call the plumbing of the system, to be able to make this work well. So you know, on the one hand, certainly rebuilding trust, but on the other hand, being realistic about what will be required to actually get this done. Thank if you. I can actually just take you back on that, it, oh, yeah, pardon me, to build on what Neely said, and I think maybe just punctuate it with, you know, a bit of a dose of reality, you know? As Neely says, this trust has been lost, but also if you're a developing nation, and you have, a, you know, South Africa, India, China, and you have an economy that is already sort of in the throes of struggling with a poverty agenda, and you're being told by developed countries that have used coal and all manner of non-renewable resources to scale their economy in their countries over the past century plus, it's sort of, you know, the, the, the righteous anger can be understood, I think, from all sides. And so when India did end up watering down that commitment to phase down coal versus phase out, I can understand the frustration because, you know, it, India being a bit bolder with that would have made a, a difference. But I can also understand from India's perspective, which is even phasing down is an enormous relative commitment on behalf of that country versus what other developed countries are committing to. Thank you.
Um, and Catherine, going forward uh, to COP27, we've got a question from an uh, audience member who says, what commitments or action do you hope to see at COP27 that we didn't see at COP26? And whether that's on finance or, or any other areas, um, feel free to talk about them. Well, I think the, the big one is the NDCs, right? So next next year, we will see the um, re-evaluations, one-year NDC re-evaluation, which was agreed at, in COP26, and we'll see that next year. And I think that'll be really, really important to kind of hold companies accountable, see the real uh, impact of, you know, Article 6, and um, really see where how, how companies are or countries are scaling and um, you know, being more bold with their commitments. I think that'll be what I'm really looking forward to it at COP27. Um, from a, a, the wider partnerships and wider private markets and, and you know, wider stakeholder commitments, I think we will continue to see more sector-specific pledges, um, you know, issues coming to the fore in, in a similar way that we did at, at COP26. And I think um, that's that's really exciting that we increasingly seeing that whole ecosystem making pledges. You know, there were sectors that were um, being discussed, such as the shipping industry, you know, the supply chain uh, issues we're, you know, we're facing now, you know, how can we make supply chains more sustainable? Just, just at a very macro scale, I think those are some of the issues that will come to the fore at COP27. And if anyone else wants to take that question as well, please jump in. No, okay. <laughs> I was not wanting to, to, to hog, but I will say, I think COP27 will be all about what Neely said at the very beginning, which is about accountability. I think commitments are fantastic. Hopefully now we start to see detailed action plans. And if COP27 can be about measuring what matters in those action plans, I'll be pleased. And do you think, you know, we were talking earlier about um, in the, the the loss of trust that was, the loss of sense of trust that was felt by some um, developing countries and the way that you understood, and many people, I think, understood the anger and how India watered down those final targets. Do you think that that kind of uh, theme will continue into the next year as Egypt goes on to host the next COP? Or do you think maybe next year we might see another issue arising? I would expect we see that to continue. You know, coal is responsible for about 40% of all the electrification in our world. And that has doubled in the last 20 years since the millennium. And that's because of emerging economies. So I expect this continued slip between cup and mouth, if you will, in the discussion around coal reduction between developing countries and developed countries to continue. And I've just got... 30 seconds to ask a last quick question to Neely. Um, I know we talked about this before, but the you know the Paris Agreement has in its headline goals that all financial flows are supposed to be aligned with low carbon. Do you think that we are now on track? You know, after for example the GFAN's announcement at COP, do you think we're now on track for that, or are we still quite quite some way off? So the GFANS members are are committed to no or low overshoot scenarios um, in terms of their um, net zero goals, and um, this covers about forty percent of private sector capital at this point. So we're on track, but we still have a ways to go. 